who is uh, one of the foremost experts on, uh, on the topic. And uh, the early reviews rave about it. And uh, it's, it's such a delight. Um, usually, we're accustomed to hearing uh, everything that's wrong with Europe, uh, whether at the macrofinancial level or at other levels. And um, it's a delight to be educated by our colleague on what's going on in the ground in fact, in the shop floor of um, Europe's industrial powerhouse. Uh, to introduce him some more, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, please welcome our Associate Dean for Graduate Education and Faculty Affairs, Tammy Gutner. I guess it's a little redundant, but I'll say more nice things about my colleague, Steve Sylvia. And we're very excited to be here to hear about his new book, uh, and it's going to, he's going to tell us about Germany's post-war economy through the lens of industrial relations. Uh, Steve is an associate professor in SIS, where he's part of the International Economic Relations Program, and he teaches courses on international trade, comparative politics, international economics. And in his free time, when he's not doing his research or teaching, He's running half the university. He's directing our <laughs> online master's degree program. He ran the doctoral program. He was president of the university senate. I can't, I couldn't even, we could spend all of our time listing all of the things you do. So I guess you're involved in industrial policy here in some way. <laughs> <laughs> I brought co-determination to the board of trustees. <laughs> Steve said this work is the <laughs> summation of all of, of his thinking and work since graduate school. He's been working on it intensely for the past several years, but he's been thinking about this for at least two decades. And his research took him all over Germany, east and west, and he promised to tell us a story about how one interview partner gave him a bottle of schnapps <laughs> to thank him for the interview, so that's something we really want to hear about. And the book has been funded by many prestigious fellowships, I want to get the names right, including the Friedrich Ebert Foundation, Hans Boker Foundation, and a Fulbright. So it's pretty impressive. Of course, we know it's being published by one of the top, the top university press in his field. And again, as Professor Porzakansky mentioned, you can't get better reviews than this. Uh, so I'm very proud and happy to help you celebrate the launch of your book and look forward to hearing your, your talk. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Tammy. Thanks, Arturo. It's you know, it's a hard thing when you do something like this because there's so many people who I should thank because it's the kind of thing I've been working on for so, for so many years that I, I know I'll leave some people out. Uh, but I certainly want to thank my colleague, uh, Randy Henning, and I want to thank Jerry Reamer, too, with whom I've had many conversations. Uh, probably the person who I should thank most of all is my wife, uh, Jenny Paxton, who I think this is the first time she's ever heard me talk. Uh, so, uh, so, so I'm nervous. So, <laughs> um, and then, you know, of course, there, there are a number of PhD students, uh, past and present, who I really appreciate you turning out uh, for this presentation. Um, I, yeah, that was uh, it, the construction workers union. The, the, uh, after I finished the interview, the, there was a big guy with a beard, and he pulls out this bottle of what's in German is called Kirschwasser, which translates to mean church water, and but a schnapps. And he's like, here, have this. And, and it, but the the other sort of most memorable gastronomic experience I've had doing this was having a lunch at the Frankfurt stock market, where. Uh, with a lunch, uh, which is the Germans' main meal. It consisted of sauerkraut and four different kinds of pork. Uh, <laughs> and you can't get more German than that. So, uh, so the topic today is, is about German industrial relations. And it is something that um, is not, uh, you know, I, I don't anticipate ever being uh, on CNN headline news with this topic. Uh, so. It, so I think I should say a little bit about why it matters. And, uh, and you know, when you look at it, I think there are some practical implications because of the size of the German economy. Arturo's mentioned that. And the centrality of industrial relations in the German economy, that Germany matters. And, and the way the German economy works matters. And industrial relations is essential to the German economy, much more than it is in the United States. 
Um, you know, and there are some theoretical reasons uh, as well. I'm looking, my focus is really on membership of, of a social movement uh, and looking at social movements in general. And I know many people in SIS study new social movements. And I'm not sure how many of you have studied new social movements have ever asked the question, what was the old social movement? Uh, the old social movement was organized labor. So this is the old social movement. Um, and then within this, the, the more intellectual debate, there's a debate about um, varieties of capitalism that people like Peter Hall have done. And this is important within this varieties of capitalism debate, my work, because uh, varieties of capitalism points to Germany as the paradigmatic uh, coordinated market economy. And coordination happens through social institutions. In particular, one important site of coordination is industrial relations. So what's going on with the unions and the employers really will have an impact on whether th this coordinated economy can continue to be coordinated. Because as these institutions have trouble, the ability, the, the, one of the main levers of coordination may not work as well as it once did. So, and the final thing, I think just for lessons, a lot of people, the kind of thing that I do get called up for nowadays um, is the question of employment and unemployment and the success that Germany has had in the wake of the financial crisis to keep unemployment down. And, and, and there are lessons to be learned in terms of social partnership, uh, which is a hallmark of German industrial relations. I, I, uh, Regularly, three, four times a year, I do talks at the State Department, at the Foreign Service Institute, about uh, European labor markets. And one of the things that I always start to talk with is I always say, who here knows who the social partners are? And uh, because it's a phrase that's thrown around in Europe regularly as if everybody knows what it is. And it's a bunch of people who are about to go to Europe. And generally, I get silence. Nobody knows who the social partners are. It's a European phrase. It isn't an American phrase. I think if you tried to use this phrase, you would certainly run into trouble in many quarters. Uh, and so the social partners are trade unions and organized management. And in the United States, we don't have organized management. So one of the social partners is missing. Um, it, it, it is generally there in a European context. So, um, so what I want to do, and what I do in the book, is I do a bit of, a, of an introduction of this whole system, of this exotic system of German industrial relations, and then talk about what's going on in it. Um, so the central question in the book is, it has to do with membership. It has to do with membership in unions, membership in employers associations, and why membership has been declining. And it's something which is a bit of a puzzle for the German context because the structures are sound, and I'll talk about how I'll talk about that in the next slide. But the other parts that I'm going to mention is I, I, I then do a test of an assessment of why membership is declining, and then I talk about the recent movements, particularly since unification, changes in the unions, and then I'll talk a little bit about employers' associations, which are extremely important in this system, and talk about some of the scholarship in that, that and where I challenge things. And then I'll, I'll say something about the future. So um, the first two chapters of this book are written to do two things. The first thing that, that, that they're written to do is to give somebody who's never read anything about German industrial relations uh, an opportunity to have an introduction to it. So first chapter talks about law and the role of the state and the courts. The second chapter talks about that. Um, you know, uniquely German institution of co-determination, which is, uh, has two components. One is having workers um, on the board of large companies. And the other one is having uh, works councils, which is sort of local elected bodies that uh, management must consult with before doing a few things. Uh, and the first two chapters, what I do is I show where these things came from and show how they've evolved up until the present. And the second thing that I mentioned, first thing is an introduction to the system. The second thing is to make a point. And the point that I'm making is that this system is pretty much sound, that it really hasn't fallen apart as 
uh, as laws uh, are in place, that the government has maintained them. When there have been gaps, the government has stepped in to manage them. And, uh, and this is true not only in the labor law, but it's also true with co-determination. That at various steps along the way, the government has reformed things to maintain them. And one of the things that's striking in comparison to the US is both of the Big parties and most of the small parties support the system of industrial relations. That, that it has broad political support. There was, a, I mentioned here, a reform of co-determination that happened not too long ago, 2009. That happened under the chancellorship of Angela Merkel, the Christian Democratic Chancellor. So things are very different in a contrast to the US, where the last major reform of labor law happened in 1959. And, uh, as I, I don't have to say more than both parties are not supportive of the system. So you have a very different environment where you have a very political, you have a very, you have an environment where the politics, the society, politics in particular I'm focusing on in the institutions are very supportive of the system, yet you have decline in membership. And so there's two, oh, one other thing I should just mention is you, when you look at the European Union, the European Union sort of is threatening in various points their laws where the European Union might be eroding pieces. But when you really look at it closely, the European laws to date haven't undermined this German system of industrial relations. And I don't think it's likely to anytime soon. So, uh, so the system is pretty much sound. So I, I have these two analogies in the book. One is it's like a fishbowl where you have the fishbowl, the fishbowl's fine, it's clean, it's got nice plants in it, but there are fewer and fewer fish. And the other analogy that I use in the book is a trestle, like a, you know, a trestle where you have vines on it that for, for grapes. And so the trestle is the system, it's holding up the vines, the vines are getting weaker, they're producing fewer grapes, and so the rest of the book really looks into why. Why has membership gone down? Even when there's the support has remained in place. And I do it, it for the unions in two chapters. The and I do multiple methods. The first chapter is a quantitative chapter. And the second chapter is qualitative. And the quantitative chapter is just a very short chapter that builds a model of unionization. And I'll, I'm just going to go through that quickly. Um, and one other thing to mention, when you look at the all, you know, people who have written before me, They've had two explanations for this decline. One has been the system has eroded. And I spend the first two chapters explaining how the system has not eroded. And then uh, the other argument by Wolfgang Streich is that the system is exhausted. And I also, in the first two chapters, say, no, the system isn't eroded. The system has, isn't exhausted. Where there are shortcomings, it is membership. It is membership decline that is the key. And membership has declined. This is, uh, this is just the raw numbers on union membership in Germany. And one of the things that is interesting is from 1950, up pretty much up through unification, you get in raw numbers a, more or less a steady increase. The 80s were a bit weak. But then after unification, you get a dramatic drop of, of unionization. Um, now, this is not what I use for my dependent variable. I use something different. I use the unionization rate, which uh, you know, the British term is union density. It's shorter. And when you're writing a book, you sort of alternate between unionization and union density. And that's, this is what I use for the dependent variable in the, quanti in the quantitative study. Now, this has three things on it. When you study Germany, it's always difficult because of the changes. Um, the, this one is unionization in Western Germany. And what you can see is even though the union membership, raw union membership went up, during the 50s, 60s, it's pretty much uh, slightly, there's a slight decrease in the unionization rate, largely because the employment was growing so fast that unionization didn't keep up. In the 1970s, you get, you get some increase, and then it's sort of level, but then it's really before unification that you get union density, unionization dropping. Now, this black line is United Germany, and this one is East Germany for the years for which there were data. And one of the striking things with the East German case is 
the unionization rate was very high to start, and it fell very fast. And there's, there are panel data that have that show unionization for this period that you can get a sense of what was going on. It, it, I can't use the panel data because this is, this is time series data, but you can get a sense with panel data that, that Eastern unification comes down and is about the same as Western unification by the time you get to um, the last place where you can get solid data, uh, which was 2009. So this is the dependent variable. I'm trying to explain what's going on with unionization particularly this decline that actually begins around the 80s. Now, for, for the uh, independent variables, I start with a model that two British economists developed uh, back in the late 60s and then build out from it. Now, this model from Ashenfelder and Penn Cavill, they, they started with economic variables. So uh, I have a bunch of economic variables that are in there. And these are ones that through the years people have tested and they've been the variables that have been the best ones to figure out what's going on with unionization in a wide variety of countries. Then uh, people followed since Ashenfelder and Penkavel and added non-economic variables. And so I added a bunch of typical non-economic variables that you'd put in to explain unionization. Manufacturing is a share of employment. Public sector is a share of employment. Female share of employment. Foreign national share of employment. Um, and so those are all demographic, those four. And then welfare expenditures as a percent of GDP. There's an argument maybe that substitutes for unions. The strike rate, more strikes, people might join unions. Uh, a friendly government in power. The SPD, when it was in government, it had a one as a dummy variable. But I added three more variables that, that nobody else has ever added. There have been a few studies that have been done, time series of German unionization. The last one that was done before I did this was done in 1989. And it's only really now that we've had enough years to be able to work in unification that it really makes sense to do one. Uh, and so I think that's why there was the big gap. And but so I'm you know stepping in doing something that hadn't been done in 20 years. These are the three new variables that I added. I added German unification as a dummy variable, and uh, one that surprised me that had never been done for Germany, and that is trade dependence as a variable, particularly the way trade is discussed involving unions, uh, both particularly in this country. And then the last one is social custom, or otherwise milieu. And this is one that struck me that I really wanted to put in there because just through my experience of doing these, inter doing these interviews and talking to union people, talking to employers associations, but particularly for this case, talking to union people, it struck me that, um, that the milieu, the social milieu that of people in working class neighborhoods, growing up, having their parents belonging to unions, sort of being educated in different, you know, in, 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 in really close knit traditions that this is something that had really declined. Now, the, hard, the tough thing with that as a variable is how do you capture it? How do you come up with an with a, a approximate variable for social custom? And it took me a long time. I was, tried different things. And, and ultimately, I settled on um, using left-wing parties as a percent of the population. Because and, and by left-wing parties, I want to specify that before unification, it, I used the SPD. And after unification, I used the SPD plus whatever the post-communist party was calling itself at the time. Uh, and eventually, uh, now it's the, called the left party, Die Linke. It merged with some uh, Western German parties. And I thought this was a good variable because there really is a milieu that, 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 ref that is reflected in party membership. I lag the variable to try to ha make sure that, that things worked um, in those terms. And I thought about including the Greens, but the Greens come from a very different milieu, that it's really a university-educated milieu. It's not a working class milieu. I did a robustness check by running it, the whole thing, just with the SPD. Came up with similar results. But to really capture Eastern Germany, I thought I needed to put in uh, the left party, as it is today, as that measure of milieu. So that's the model. You know, I, I 
basically the way I did the model is I wanted to throw lots and lots and lots of variables at, uh, in, in the mix so that if any variable stood out as being significant, that it was really put in a challenging test of significance uh, to, to have a whole range of variables. So if it survived and remained significant with all these alternative variables, that, uh, that really in indicated that it was important. So I'm not going to dwell on this for very long, uh, but this is just sort of the rack of variables that I used. I, I used a lagged a dependent variable as well to really make the test rigorous. And when you go to the results, the, the things that I found was, uh, the other thing that I did is I, I did a z-score to get standard weights on the variables. And there were the three, these three variables um, that are listed one, two, and three were all very close in terms of impact when you, when you measured them. They were highly significant and with standardized variables they were all pretty close to the same size. Social customs stood out as the strongest. Um, and that which was something that nobody's ever really looked at in a quantitative way. There's been lots of discussion in a qualitative sense but nobody had done a quantitative test. Public sector employment came out big. That's very common in many countries that public sector, the bigger your share of public sector, the higher your unionization rate. And the third one is an interesting one as well. It's uh, that uh, you know, unification was positively associated with, uh, with uh, unionization, positively correlated with uh, unionization. And as I said, I think you know, that it's something that won't last over time probably. But in this time frame that I'm looking at, I think it's a reflection of the more collective culture that was in the East, um, that the East had a much smaller service sector, and uh, that those two things, I think, combined explain it. That I think the milieu, in an essence, was stronger in the East. Uh, and it, so some of the milieu may have even been picked up with that dummy variable. The last one is one that I also found quite interesting. It, when you think about it, it's not a surprise. Um, that trade is positively correlated with unionization in Germany. Because Germany's export sectors are where the unions are. Manufacturing, you know, me mechanical engineering, uh, chemicals. So um, it's not, you know, where German unions are the weakest are in the private service sector. So, it's, so even though in the United States you tend to hear an automatic assumption that international trade, globalization, opening up is bad for unions. I don't think it necessarily is. I think it's a function of the structure of the American economy, that it plays out that way. But you can have an economy organized in a very different way where the big export sectors are in manufacturing and it does, um, and, and you find that actually liberalization, free trade helps the unions. Um, so that's the quantitative piece. Now, I just want to say one last thing on this is my, the qualitative chapter, it's a different sort of writing more like an, uh, an economics article and writing political science. That, that, that chapter, the previous one with the quantitative study, is by far the shortest chapter in the book. That it's like 30 pages. And then the, the, the qualitative chapter on the unions that follows is like 70 pages. And, uh, but one of the things, I just have a snippet from there. I thought one of the reasons why I wanted to look into this question of milieu is in my qualitative research, I found it coming up. And there was one very prominent place where there was a big report that the DGB, which is the Trade Union Confederation in Germany, they, they, were, they had this confidential series of um, reports and they were trying to figure out why is membership going down. And their summary report, they identified that the, that the union the natural union milieu is shrinking as, as their explanation. So I found that helpful to have confirmation both in the quantitative and in the qualitative case on this question of milieu. And the striking thing about it is it is a societal explanation. It's a sociological explanation for declining membership rather than a structural one, which is the, the conventional wisdom. Um, I, so I, I want to say a little bit more about the unions. Uh, I spent a lot of time doing research on the unions. Uh, one thing, one of the, it's funny when you talk about where does a book come from. One of the things that when I was writing this book, somebody asked me to write an article about the German trade union movement. 
And when I was writing the article, that this came to me as something, as a point to make, that even though you've had structural, formal, legal continuity for the German trade union system throughout the post-war era, in reality, if you look at it, you have a sharp de facto break in the organization that happens, that you have a lot status quo for the first 40 years, that you have 16 unions, uh, that for a while there's 17, a little tiny one, and then, then there's a merger and they go back to 16. But you have 16 unions. They are organized basically in industrial sectors. These industrial sectors were laid out initially, actually, in the 40s. And so you have this continuity, continuity, continuity. And then all of a sudden, in 10 years, during the 1990s, you have radical change in the organizations. You have a massive amount of mergers. And in 10 years, you move from this 16 industrial union system to eight unions. And of those eight unions, two unions have more than two thirds of the members. So in practice, you get a different system. When you just have two unions organizing 70% of all of the workers, you end up with, you know, as I said, in practice, it's really a different system. So that's why I call it the first trade union movement and the second trade union movement of Germany. And uh, this, when, so that begs the question, why? Why did this happen? And it happened because there were um, two problems that the unions were facing. One was a financial problem, and the second one was a membership problem. The two problems are linked. And the initial attempt to try to fix the problem, there was a lot of intellectual discussions. I was involved in, there was this thing that was called the, the Hattingen Forum, where you know, there was all these people talking about what to do, and I, I was pretty heavily involved in that in the early 90s when it was going on. But ultimately, when the unions did make changes, what they did is they settled for a very simple economies of scale argument. They argued, our unions are too small. We need to make them bigger. If we make them bigger, we can solve our, uh, we can solve our membership problem. Because we'll be able to, if we merge our units, we'll be big enough to have economies of scale to provide proper services that will attract members, and that'll solve our problems. And so they went through a series of mergers that, that took place. A lot of them were not exactly coordinated. Once the mergers started, the big unions saw a lot of vulnerable unions, little ones that were really in financial dire straits. So the big unions started to gobble up the small ones as quickly as they could. The small unions looked to merge not because a union was in a sector that was like the smaller one. But basically, the leadership of the smaller unions, they would look and say, OK, which union is the pay scale higher? And which union has a better retirement plan? And so that's basically how the mergers happen. And so you ended up with this lopsided system with these two big unions, and then some small unions that, that, uh, that survived. Uh, and but, but there was a problem with, with this merger system, that the merger system did not stop the membership declines. Membership declines continued. So the, this economies of scale argument as a solution did not work. Instead, most union member, or many potential union members and existing union members, you, know, you had mergers like the metal workers absorbed the woodworkers union, which didn't make, and, and the clothing and textile workers union which didn't make a lot of sense as far as, dis as, far as you know, sectors. So you have the question, if, you're, if you work as in a sewing factory, you're sewing clothes, why would you join the metal workers union? Why would you be a little tiny piece of the metal workers union? So a lot of, of the current and potential members, they had these large organizations that resulted that had millions of members, they would say, why would I join these organizations? So that didn't help. And then you actually began to get some smaller residual organizations. Some of them, many of them, weren't in the DGB. They began to chip away to attract members on, on a, uh, basically offering very small professional units. For example, the physicians, which only have you know, like 30,000 30, members in their union, that they began to organize in a way that they never had before and expanded their union. 
So it was clear that the solution for membership was not in size alone. So the three big unions began to experiment with ways to deal with this collapse of membership. And um, I'm going to talk about the, the, the three biggest unions. And each of them went in a different way. One, the chemical uh, uh, workers union, uh, they went, their, their mining chemicals and energy uh, went in a direction of cooperating with their employers. That was their focus. Um, the metal workers union, the, if there's a union that's famous in Germany, it's this metal workers union. They started borrowing things from the US. And then the third union, which was this mega union merger of five unions in the public and private service sector, they don't have a strategy. They're a mess. And I'll explain <laughs> that union uh, a little further on. Um, so um, when you look at this first union, the, the, the chemical workers union, they've pursued a very clever strategy. They've often been criticized by the more class conscious people in the trade unions as being sort of sellouts and, and um, you know, not being aggressive and not being socialist. And, but when you look at this union, putting the ideology aside, they've been perhaps the most successful union in Germany in terms of getting influence over collective bargaining and beyond collective bargaining for their members. And they've done that through close cooperation with the employers. That they've worked closely with the employers and they've managed to expand the scope of what the union has a say over. To far beyond the, the case in any other sector. So, and their wages have stayed up. And the, in, in all the measures of competing with the metal workers union, which tends to be the more left wing, the more militant union, this chemical workers union has done just as well, if not better. And so, it, in many ways, it's a success story. But there's only one problem. This close cooperation with the employers, they've sort of left the members out. So in terms of membership, in activating membership and making membership inter members wanting to join, they haven't really developed a means to make members to join. The, mem the members see the union works closely with the employer and delivers for us without us having to do anything. And so, that is, so it's, a, it's been a clever strategy, but it hasn't dealt with their membership problem. And their membership has declined. The most interesting and innovative union is, is the metal workers union. Um, and the metal workers union, they began to look at and copy stuff being done in the United States. And you can look at that and you say, why? <laughs> you know, the US union movement has been going down the tubes for years. But you've had in the US efforts to develop social movement unionism, grassroots mun unionism. You know, there have been a, you know, Service Employees International Union is famous for the Justice for Janitors campaign. And a lot of this sort of militant uh, uh, activity that hasn't been done in Germany. And the other thing is, in the United States, we have a tradition of having to organize workplaces because the way our labor law works. That you have to win a representation election in an individual workplace to get union recognition. That isn't the case in Germany. That in Germany, you join unions like you join political parties. And the employers and the unions have tended to bargain at the sectoral level. And so the idea of being union and non-union just doesn't really fit the German model because uh, there have been some gaps in this lately. But t in, for many, many years, you're pretty much covered by, by whatever the union negotiates. And, and you don't have elections in the workplace. So that sharp divide just doesn't exist in Germany. So it meant that in the US, people have developed and working for decades. How do you get people to join unions? And it, as membership declined in the German unions, as it really got severe, it led them to look at places where people have focused on organizing. And the US is one of those places. So you had an interesting exchange. You had a lot of discussion about grassroots militancy and getting people involved and perhaps even confrontation uh, to, to organize workers. But in practice, it's not what the metal workers did, even though they talked that way. What they really did 
is they, they looked at the workplace and they, and they um, decided that they would have union officials with expertise in efficiency work closely with local members to help keep workplaces open that were on the edge of closing. That really weren't, you know, they tended to be the famous German Mittelstand, the small and medium sized enterprises. Not all of them are great, and not all of them are super efficient. So the union worked with, with experts, economic experts, to come up with suggestions to help make different workplaces more profitable. That involved the members, got the union involved directly with the members, and had the union play a constructive role. And the biggest thing, though, that they've done is a complete reorganization within an internal reorganization to make it worth your while if you are a local union official to recruit more members, which wasn't the case before. And by doing that, they've managed to have some success. That IG Metall last year, the Metal Workers Union, actually expanded its, its size of its members who are actively at work. They've always expanded the retirees. Uh, but they sort of people who actually have a job that the size of the union expanded. It was the first German union to do that in well over a decade. And so this changing is something any economist would tell you, change the incentive structure and you'll get different results. So what the union did is they changed their incentive structure to make it worthwhile for local people, the local union officials to organize workers because their budget will get bigger. And so you've had early organizing success but the question remains, is this low-hanging fruit? They're fighting against you know, what I showed in chapter three and, and in, also in chapter four, this deterioration of the social milieu. Can this reorganization of incentives be powerful enough to cut against the, the fragmentation of the working class milieu? It's too soon to tell. Um, and there are risks in what they've done you know, if you're a mid-level union official and you've had your budget cut because it's money's going to the locals to help people to organize, you're not happy. And if you're not happy, you may, when the leadership transition happens, you know, cause difficulties to try to reverse things within the union. The other thing is it's very difficult. These unions tend to be, they have a top-down element in them. And it's hard to motivate the grassroots and then have the grassroots vote in the right directions for works council elections and things like that. So trying to keep that balance between top down and bottom up is a tricky thing. Aren't too many more slides, I'll, I'll let you know that. Um, the, um, so this is the last union uh, that I'm gonna talk about, Verity. Verity's a funny union. Um, it's the product of a merger of five service sector unions, public and private. So you have like your government service sector union and your retail, like department store union merged with a postal workers union, with a media workers union. Uh, so it's just this big jumble of unions. And the idea was to try to get a critical mass. Briefly, it was the biggest union in Germany, had three million members, but the members really started to decline fast because the, the union had five unions, has 13 sectors in it, and when they tried to pull off the merger, most of the mergers you'd have one big union and a little one, and the big one would swallow the little one. This one was different. You had the public sector one was the biggest, but there were so many other ones that the only way they could come to an agreement is to say, we're just gonna freeze everything as it is. We're gonna freeze the budget allocation. It's all, it's all gonna be proportional, and in essence, you really have never had a merger of this union in practice, even though it has one label, Verity, as, as, uh, as a structure. You've never had the, 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 the actual interior of the union merge. So no economies of scale, no advantages. So there are occasional things where they try some of these tactics, like IG Metall has tried and, and some other unions have tried. But they can't spread them because the, the union is so fragmented and people are so fixated on keeping their pieces in place that they haven't been able to really make a breakthrough. They've tried to do reforms in 2008. That failed. So this union was, is really stuck. And it was funny. I was in January. I, I gave a talk um, in Frankfurt. And I presented this piece. It was at the Metal Workers Union. It was um, 
And I presented this piece of, of the research. It was a short talk. And the, the president of the, G, of the DGB was there. That's like the head of the AFL-CIO. And he came from the Postal Workers Union. So he came up to me afterwards. And, and uh, so I said, well, this will be. I had spoken to him before. And, and he said to me, he said, you're right. You're right about Verity. And that, he, he said, see that guy over there? He said, that guy is a Postal Workers Union member. I was a Postal Workers Union member. We still think of ourselves as Postal Workers Union, as, uh, you know, as Printers Union, as Retail Union. And he said, if anything, he said, you're right about the two movements. And he said, if anything, the thing that he would predict is maybe there'll be a third postware movement when Verity breaks up. And so Verity hasn't broken up yet. It has a, it has a, a dominant head of the union. But he's, when he steps down, which will be in three or four years, it will be interesting to see what happens to that union and whether it even survives in one piece. So that's the union side. You've had some successes in dealing with membership. You've had an organizational success in the chemical sector, but not a membership success. And then you have a union that's, that's got problems. It's really stuck. Now, so this is the employer side. I just, there's two employers associations. And the thing that I wanted to get at is, the, in the book is the existing literature um, talks about membership and employers associations going down. And that's true. When you, when you look at it, you see membership and employers association going down. But the thing that I wanted to do in the book is it's a bit like the old story with the, the drunk looking for the keys under the lamppost with looking at data for employers. It's very hard to find data on employers. And for those of you who haven't heard this story, it's an old political science story that uh, uh, Tammy mentioned as a PhD director, this is one that you always haul out to the PhD students, uh, and that is you should not do a study like this. And that is, so the story is this, there's a drunk, and he's, he's in the parking lot, and he's under, he's under a street light, he's looking for his keys, and then somebody else walks up to the drunk and says, uh, what are you doing? And the drunk says, I'm, I'm looking for my keys. And he said, oh, okay, can I help you? He said, well, do you remember where you dropped them? And the drunk says, yeah, I dropped them over there. And then the answer, so the person asked, well, why are you looking here? So, well, the street light's here, so I can see here. I can't see over there. And so there's, a bit of, so there's been a bit of that going on in looking at employers in Germany, that the only organization that ever released data publicly was this, the Metal Employers Association. So everybody looked at this, they saw all these declines, and they said, ah, you know, employers association density is declining. And what I decided to do is I, I been talking to the chemical employers for, for a long time. And I said to them, do you have data? They said, yes. I said, will you give me your data? They said, yes. And nobody else had ever asked them for their data. It wasn't public. So when you look at their data, so you look at the, the metals. You see it dropping. You can't see it here. But it's like starts up in the mid-70s, and then it drops down to you know, just over 60 in the west. And then this is, this is the east, where it drops dramatically. And when you look at the, for all of Germany, for the chemicals, the membership in terms of how many, if you, this is in terms of employment. So you take all the companies that are members, you, you look at how many they employ, and then you figure out what percentage do, mem, do companies that are members of the association employ. And you look here, and for the, for the chemicals, it fluctuates between about 75 and 80%. It's stable. So the first point I wanted to make is look at a little more data, and you see you don't see a uniform pattern. You see in chemicals stability, in metals decline. So the question is why? And one thing I should say is, well, why does this matter? Um, this matters, the, the, the reach of unions, the reach of collective bargaining in Germany is not a product of unionization rate. The reach of collective bargaining is a product of employer organization rate. Because the employers have a much higher organization rate, and the contracts cover everyone who's under those agreements. And there's actually some provisions where you can extend it beyond them. So when you're looking at Germany, and, and you're looking at the reach of collective bargaining, union, the unionization in and of itself doesn't tell you the reach of collective bargaining. The, the organization of the employers is what matters most. Um, and so what I did in that chapter is I did a lot of looking at why you had this decline and, and why you had this gap, why chemicals was different. And I point at two things. One, 
I think that the, the labor and management in the chemical sector did a much better job as far as industrial relations than you did in the metal sector. So I think that's one reason why companies didn't leave. And then, but there's also structural differences. The chemical sector is much more concentrated as a sector, and the, in contrast that to mechanical engineering, to the, medical, to, the, to the metal sector, that you have suppliers and producers all in the same sector, which is a messy arrangement and has led to particularly the, the smaller suppliers that supply big companies like, you know, like BMW and, and Daimler leave. So I flesh out a lot of that, and I look in that chapter. I look at some other sectors as well. I won't go into the details on that, uh, unless you have questions. Um, now, so uh, in you know, in conclusion, this just summarizes the points that I've made. Where just you can see that you know the structure itself, the argument I make in the book that it's sound, but you still have this membership dropping, and the membership dropping where the system is weakened. It's all about declines in membership. Um, and when you look at the labor side, it's really a deterioration of the social milieu that that's a, plays a big story that people haven't talked about. Um, when you look at the employers, there's, it really has to do with the structures of the sector, whether employers are leaving their associations or not. And it, it, it's one of the things that I have to say in this book. There are several places where, where I engage with Wolfgang Strake. Uh, this, is an, this is one where I, uh, Strake made an argument about employers and why uh, companies belong to employers associations. So I, I, I challenged what Strake argues in that chapter. Um, making the point that trade in this case has a positive impact on unionization uh, is another point. You know, the, the, the argument that I make about de facto having two post-war German trade union movements that are very different industrial unionism and multi-sectoral unionism. And uh, you know, the last point uh, is this looking at the strategies that different unions have tried to, to get members. So for, I said I'd talk about the future. I'll say a little bit about the future. I think this architecture of the laws uh, in the state and supportive parties are going to continue to prop this system up. And membership has declined. I don't think we're going to have a great reversal of membership. But um, it's a little early to tell whether Ige Metal's strategy is going to produce a, a, a turnaround. It may be a flash in the pan. It may not. But I do think that industrial relations will continue to play an important role in Germany for the foreseeable future. I don't think we're going to have an alternative system. And for most German employees, uh, collective bargaining, the negotiations between labor and management is going to have a big impact on what you paid, how many vacation days you have, and all your other wages and benefits. And that's it. So um, I can take questions for anybody who has questions. Yes, yeah, so and maybe uh, until somebody. Uh builds up the courage to ask, I'll, I'll ask a question, Steve. Sure. I was wondering whether, <clears throat> you know, in this country, if you were to ask whether, we, whether unions are part of the problem or part of the solution, you'd get a good discussion going. Um, uh, certainly, we've seen a lot of that frontline uh, discussion in the services sector, and in particular, say, in public schools and so on, where where, well, even here in D.C., we, we had quite a struggle over that. What's your link between this and the bigger picture assessment? The, the highly productive German economy, would you say that in that regard, the unions and the drop in union membership is part of the problem or part of the solution that, that the continuous improvement and productivity have taken place with the cooperation or despite uh, the unions? How, how would you connect those two things, the productivity story and the union yeah. story? When you look at the productivity story for Germany, it's complex. And, and um, when you look at the productivity story for Germany, I don't think unionization really plays a role uh, in it, plus or minus. Because if you look at the 50s, 60s, 70s, 
Productivity in Germany per year goes up 3 4% a year. Really remarkable rates. And then you look at the 80s, you go from the 80s on, and German productivity just collapses. That past 30 years, German productivity growth has been 1% per year, roughly. And you've had you know, strong unions earlier. You, you, know, you have unions still significant, although somewhat attenuated now. And so you've had change in, in, you know, in, in your dependent variable of productivity, but the unionization one has been constant. So I don't think you can see the unions as barriers to productivity growth because of those early growth years. You know, when people look at this in a more qualitative sense, they'll point at works councils. And they'll talk about how the works councils, if anything, are helpful in terms of getting, man getting labor buy-in and, and having participation as an alternative model uh, that has been successful. The other thing is where the confrontation happens in Germany when it does happen, it's not in the workplace level. It's at this level of the metal employers negotiating with the metal workers union. So you don't have this job control. You, know, you don't have that sort of structure which has been a barrier to productivity at times in the US. Um, it really isn't in place in Germany. You don't have that same dynamic. Thank you. Yeah, uh, I think ahead. Robert was first. Yes, go ahead, Robert. Hey, thanks, Steve. Th this is wonderful. I've worked with German companies since the 80s, and I've never understood the system as well as I have after half an hour of you talking. Thank you. Uh, w w one thing I'm curious, uh, and I don't know if your research covered this, but the demographics of the people that don't join the unions and any changes that you may have seen over time uh, with that. Well, one thing that I didn't you know, mention. Young, old, or uh, yeah. uh, you know, native German versus new German, anything like yeah. that? Yeah, one thing I like didn't that? mention, but in, in, in the quantitative study, there is a negative correlation between foreign national and unionization. And I think that's consistent with the milieu argument that uh, the German, you know, German society has not exactly been integrative as far as foreign nationals. And so foreign nationals were, are more often socially on the outs, even if foreign nationals are disproportionately in manufacturing. Um, now, the manufacturing one did not come up as positive. And female, it did not come, there was no correlation. Um, the female, uh, percentage of female w women in the workforce did not correlate either. Uh, so those didn't correlate. Typically, I did not have a youth variable. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to do it, and I really didn't come up with a good measure. I, but when you do look at the data, uh, you see that youth membership is lower than, um, than, the, than the older cohorts. There is definitely that phenomenon, which is common in many places. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, as a German, I found it extremely interesting. So, <laughs> um, my question would be, how do you deal with uh, dualization um, argument that has been put forward? What are you? The dualization argument that has, has been put forward by Anke Hassel and, for example, Kathleen Thielen as well, that um, the service sector is mostly because of structural reasons um, declining in, in unionization and so forth. And that, well, you know, the um, in industrial sector stays yes. as it ever was exactly and so um, because you make a very strong argument for un trade union agency I would say so how sure yeah yeah I mean the manufacturing variable in the quantitative study is implicitly cup measuring the services as well because if it came up positive then we would have seen a correlation between manufacturing you know if, we, if there's a correlation in any way, we would have seen a differentiation between manufacturing and non-manufacturing. So I, although it certainly is something that comes up, I did not see it uh, in the data. So, uh, so that's, that's where I left it. Yes, go ahead. Go. Steven. Hi, Steve. Um, just um, I remember some time ago reading about France in, let's say, the 60s and 70s, and um, the reform of the third level education there um, really did affect unionism in that, you know, they often refer to a kind of a brain drain um, in terms of, you know, what the union did uh, and how it saw itself. And I was just wondering if that may feed into the social milieu in the German case. I wanted, I, I wonder, I mean, I don't know personally, but was there any reform in education, third level education, maybe before this decline started happening? And if so, 
maybe the lack of proselytization or the lack of you know um, uh, recruitment maybe down to the fact that people who are going into unions are uh, well those who used to go into unions and who became you know leaders and and thought leaders within unions in let's say the 60s 70s and 80s whether they're now in university is that possible yeah I think one of the things that's if interesting when you do interviews with unions if you go to the headquarters and you walk particularly the floors where um, the president of the union is you'll see you know um, you'll see doctor, you know, what the Germans call a doctor title. You'll see doctor so-and-so, doctor so-and-so, doctor so-and-so. Uh, and it, it's amazing the, uh, the intellectual uh, attraction that you've had. People who are you know, interested in left-wing politics, went to university, end up working for unions. It's, it's considerable. I've never seen a country quite like it. You know, in the US, it's generally rank and file. You come up, and the head of the research department will have a PhD, and that's it. Uh, and so it's different in Germany, you know, but the question that you asked, it, it, it's, it gets at the milieu question. One of the, so one of the questions that when you look at this, you actually see union density going up in the 70s. So you have to, so I had to think about, well, why, why was that going on? And I think that when you look at the discussion in Germany in the 1960s, the sociological discussion, you had people like Ralph Derendorf talking about white collar, uh, sort of, you know, white collar workers is also being potential for union members, and you had Keynesianism, a little bit of Keynesianism come in, at least the discussion of it in Germany. It was the brief moment for Keynes, it was in the late 60s and early 70s in Germany. And so you had this notion that unions weren't just for blue collar workers anymore, that happened as a sociological change in the 60s. And so that's when you started getting teachers joining and public sector people joining. So in, in that period, that was a, an intellectual opening of the milieu outside of the blue collar to bring in um, some of the people who we do now recognize as rather standard union members, like public sector employees. So I think there was that sort of change that happened. There wasn't a dramatic, you know, there were some university reforms, certainly, in Germany. Uh, in the 70s, but they didn't have that sort of effect that, that you mentioned as in France. Yes, sir, you have a question? Go ahead. Not having uh, been able to read your book, it is entirely possible that you may have addressed it, but it's a very simple thing, the decline to address the, or to understand the decline in the union membership. If you compare, for instance, a metal worker, a uh, automotive worker here in this country, they are fighting for something. They need some other goal, whether it is now the salary, uh, better social uh, structure, better benefits, and so on. In Germany, you don't need that. Have you ever considered comparing the salaries and the social benefits of a worker or a physician or whatever else, uh, they are in no fighting condition. They don't need to fight. If you get six weeks at the very minimum in vacation every year, if you get, uh, uh, let's say, pregnancy or other uh, delivery vacations of half a year or something like this. Now, why should you fight? Well, Needless if the to need say. to fight determined unionization, this country would have a unionization rate considerably higher than it is. So it, it, it isn't, uh, you know, so need to fight isn't the story because there are many countries, the very poor countries, that have the need to fight and have low unionization rates. So I think when you look at that from country to country, you don't have a correlation in the, the, the lower the income in a society, the higher the unionization rate is. That, that really doesn't stand out internationally. Well, I'm thinking just not just Germany. I'm just thinking, I'm thinking broadly worldwide. That if you think about it, that you know Haiti does not have the highest unionization rate in the world. Uh, they certainly have a lot to fight for. So there, there are many variables that, 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 that are involved in why people join unions. 
Just a related question. Uh, do you think, is there some kind of free rider problem maybe yes. on the, because here as, you know, th there are certain states where if there are unions, you must join them, and then there are certain states where y if there are unions, you don't have to join them. It sounds like you don't have to join them here, so maybe contentment uh, is, is, has, you know, because of a free riding effect has led to some of this drop. Well, you know, Germany, like uh, the United States, has, um, has a free rider problem. In, in, in Germany, it has to do with the fact that um, company unions, or excuse me, not company unions, that a union shop is illegal in Germany. So having to join a union as uh, part of your job, being required to join a union, is illegal in Germany. Um, and for, you know, basically when the German basic law was written, you know, the German constitution, right after World War II, the idea of having compulsory membership in any organization after the Nazi experience was just something that was not going to happen. So that's why in Germany you, you, you can't have any requirements to join a union. And the other part, but the free rider part, is both courts in the US and in Germany had you know, independently came to have rulings that said you cannot differentiate in wages, hours, other conditions of employment between union and non-union members, that that's been forbidden. Uh, and so that has caused a free rider problem that if the courts had ruled another way, it wouldn't exist in either country. Um, I think we only have time for one more. We've got to be out of here in about 10 minutes, so. <laughs> uh, I, I think, when I think about German uh, uh, unions, I think about organizations which are not only making this bargaining, you know, it's a kind of an organization of, of people going together to holidays, um, offering services, newspapers, you know, there were um, uh, groups playing soccer together, working, workers groups playing soccer together, and I think, um, what, what's your opinion on this? Was it, was it a mistake of trade unions of not strengthening these parts um, of, of, yeah, f of a feeling of togetherness, with what is typical for social movements in the last uh, 10 or 20 years, was it professionalized too much? I, I, that's, that's what I think about yeah. very much as, as a problem. That's the milieu. That's what I'm talking about. And you had this deterioration when you, if you know, if you look in, in 1950, you know, from 40s, even before, well, you know, started again in the 40s, that you had the union whole housing authority that went bankrupt in the 80s. You had the union supermarket that went bankrupt in the 80s. And so you had before this whole almost alternate society, which was a strong milieu. And as those things fell apart, as company towns fell apart and people moved away, that you, this is, this is what I mean by the deterioration of the milieu. That that, and, and you had, you know, choruses, you had, you know, soccer teams, that there's still some of that, at least the soccer teams, and uh, the, uh, and, uh, but mo this is, but this is what I'm trying to capture with the milieu. It's a hard thing to capture. One of the things that I looked for that I didn't find in time series data was commuting times. And I was thinking commuting times would be an interesting proximate variable because it would be, do you have a working class neighborhood or not? But I wasn't able to get the data for it. And so I settled on this social democratic party membership is, is the best that I could do. Uh, and I think it works, but, um, it, but that's exactly what I'm trying to capture. And so the question, the ultimate question, I think, for the future is, will reform, sort of internal structural reforms to incentivize organizing, would that, is that enough to turn the tide uh, in the face of a milieu that's likely to just continue to dissipate? Well, we still have a few minutes for you to uh, grab a cookie and some coffee and tea. Yeah. And other than that, let's uh, join me in thanking Dr. Sylvia. Thank you.